plus f of x and q should be a little bit more careful, but right? two terms hidden. So that's that's a rather generic structure of, of the collision integral. You have uh, some real thing, which is actually, if you think of it a little bit, is nothing else but matrix element times a delta function. Remember, it are the finest ones, at least in the simplest non-interactive case, had a delta function of uh, epsilon minus epsilon. <coughs> so that's, uh, this thing mentally take care of matrix element square and energy conservation. And this thing is about uh, in and out distribution functions. <coughs> How populated is state with an index P minus Q. So you collide boson with state with state with index Q with, with another boson with an index P minus Q you end up with boson of index P. You're looking for the distribution function of this state. For that, you need to know distribution function of this and distribution function of that. Right? And they are coming in this uh, funny combination. Now, suppose I, I'm so dumb when I'm doing this thing in equilibrium. Now, in equilibrium, remember that my thing f of epsilon was just cotangent of uh, <coughs> epsilon number of 2t, epsilon minus 3. Okay. So now there is a magic identity, <laughs> I take a quad, 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 quad tangent A times quad tangent B plus 1 minus quad tangent A plus B. A minus B is equal to this is equal to that. So if I divide it by cotangent A minus cotangent minus plus plus, uh, if I divide by that, that all I'm just telling you what's the formula of cotangent of A plus B. It's this product plus one divided by this times two. Right? Now notice that this major quote unquote identity is precisely what is responsible for the fact that the equilibrium distribution nullifies collision right? That's an extremely generic thing. So you, you make this thing more yeah. complicated. Well, you can calculate metric, but, but the structure of of this distribution function will always separate and, and have this shape. Okay? So it's not a proof of the fluctuation dissipation theorem, but at least it's sort of a step by step demonstration that if your distribution is like this, then it's not going to change. Okay? So it unifies, of course, the left hand side because it's stationary and it commutes with your Hamiltonian. And it always nullifies the right. You can do a little bit more. You can show that this solution is not just solution, but it's locally attractive solution. So if you deviate slightly from equilibrium, you always have a tendency of going back. Yes, clear. A couple of questions. So what do you mean going higher order? Higher order and we, you left that lots of terms. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we calculated with sigma. In, 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 in a very specific approximation, just second order yeah. in interaction. So if you go to high order calculation for sigma, you mean literally you'll have that? Yes. You'll be proposed of that? Yes, you'll be, you'll be, it, it will. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I guess the second question, that's the property of a cubic, where is that? Say it again? That's the property of a cubic theory or not? The structure seems to be a property of a cubic theory. Right. Right. It's a, it's a property of... Like if you had 40 interaction, would be... Look, it's a property of how many particles you have on a mass shell. If you right. dis dissect this diagram, here you have two particles, and that will bring you this combination no matter what. If you have five of the four theory, and you have these three, three particles on a mass shell, 
then uh, it will be slightly different, slightly more complicated, but pretty much having the same major property that Katanjant will nullify it. Won't it have three apps? Will it have three apps? Probably, yes. Uh, okay. I want to say yes, but I'm not sure because one of these functions may, may be always sorted. Okay. I don't remember. So, but wouldn't this equilibrium distribution be modified also by the interaction? So that this fixed point gets slightly shifted by the interaction? Can, can you repeat that one more? Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, this cotangent epsilon man is a non interactive distribution, right? Yeah, no, no. Uh, so the statement is that if you have, no matter how complicated the interacting system, but you are in equilibrium, this is a set. Interaction do not modify this thing. Right? And that's an actually interesting discussion, because if you calculate what is known as n of k, occupation number of the state k, for example, for light interpreter, right? Then you got some power law and then the jumping around it. So you may say, wow, interaction modified my distribution function. It's not the same distribution function which I entered. The distribution function properly defined, and I actually skip slightly works properly, but it's in the notes, uh, has always property that no matter what, no matter interaction, Lattinger, Schmattinger, strongly interacting, <laughs> weakly interacting. In equilibrium, it's always contact. Or tangent if it's terminal. And this is fluctuation dissipation theory. Look. Just to follow up on this question, I think that the fact that the UVL operator has been renormalized, it means that we are doing this uh, Boltzmann equation for the quasi particle. You do, it, you do it for quasi-particles, but, but, but again, it, it's a matter of definition. There is, a, there is a different thing, which is called n of k, which is occupation number of a state with, with momentum k. That one is not going to be step function uh, at zero temperature if you have interaction. You, know, you may have power, or you may have interesting things. But this function f, again, one should take care of what it is exactly, this one, in equilibrium, no matter what, at zero temperature, is a step function. Uh, Torsten? Um, so is there a way to, uh, to get like this n of k distribution function out of what we have? Because, because usually, I mean, if you expect that it's not equilibrium, yes. so you can uh, tell you the distribution yes. function. n of k is nothing else but gk in coinciding time. But it's not that. So it's not equal to imaginary part of G retarded in this picture. No, G retarded doesn't know about occupation numbers at all. No, only about scale. So this is a now in non-interacting theory or whatever, the simple theory, they, they are the same, pretty much. But if you go to the more complicated things, you, you should be aware that this thing and what I call F are not the same. And one of them is always contingent and equilibrium, and another one, no. Mike? The, the footnote is on page 91. <laughs> what? The footnote is on page 91. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what footnote? <did you? coughs> it's about this question. Page 91. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's make three, ten minutes break, and then we'll move to something <laughs> I know the partial answers. Uh, so, you know, it, you're always welcome to write me an email, and if I know an answer, I, I, will, I promise to answer. I don't promise that I know. Um, all right, so now I just switch on your thing in some potential uh, interacting with the bar of harmonic oscillators, essentially how they're related to them. Right. So I want 
to show you what it means in terms of Keldish thing. And then uh, instead of what people usually do in caldera uh science, they go to sort of zero temperature and discuss how quantum time is affected by dissipation. Um, it's a very interesting story. Um, it is in the notes, but there is no much non-equilibrium science can add to it because it's zero temperature, ground state, ever so nothing else. Instead of it, I want to take an op I will take an opposite limit of high temperature. Uh, claim that the problem become essentially classical in this limit, and show how how this formalism is related to formalism of a classical non-equilibrium science. Namely, Langevin equations, Poitier-Planck equations, uh, equation theorems, uh, uh, whatever. All right. So that that's that's the goal. All right. So now let's try marching towards this goal. So. Uh, And what you do is you, you, you write your uh, final number x but square over 2 uh, plus or minus potential. But you acknowledge that you also live in a Keldish one. Hope it's now. So then you, you go uh, plus and transform into classical quantum. So what, what you're getting after this is thing like this, x quantum. Now second derivative because it's it's a real field and it's not a field. Classical minus d of x plus plus d quantum. coming from upper and whatever lower part of your quantum changing of variables. Now notice that if, if I take uh, again ds over dx quantum, then what I'm getting is x double dot minus or plus um, dx of uh, x plus or plus x quantum minus dx of x plus minus x And if I will go for a classical solution, the quantum component is equal to zero, then for miracle, what I got is, is Newton equation. So in this limit, what I'm getting is up to factor of two, x double dot. I'm better for plus Anyway, uh, plus D classical, D D D X of X classical is equal to zero. So, so that's the way you derive Newton equation for you. Uh, okay, so now we want to, to connect with this guy to, to the bunch of harmonic oscillators. So I have to uh, action of the bar, and the bar is by whatever reason one half. Um, 
number, sum over all oscillators, which I will label with index S. Don't remember why. DT. And then, uh, then you have, so the, the, the oscillators will be parameterized by coordinates phi. Phi of the real coordinates. So again, phi classical phi quantum, how we love quadratic form, classical phi quantum with index S and what is seen here is a zero second derivative of time minus omega S square, second derivative of time minus omega square and then regularization which which Rio just just alluded to. Right. So this is our uh, oscillators. Finally I want uh, to have a coupling between my particle and, and the oscillators and the coupling uh, I will simply take a linear coupling some S some coupling constant G S phi S Absolutely. Most idiotic approximation. Now that should be put again on the Keltish contour. And then you again go to phi plus phi minus, uh, classical quantum, two lines of algebra. But what you end up with is sum over S, G S, phi plus quantum, sigma 1 matrix, uh, x. So the very simple manipulation tells you that this is kind of uh, off-diagonal coupling. Quantum phi is coupled to classical x and classical phi is coupled to, to quantum x. It's just, if you think of the, the cycle, it, it is expected. Again, because, uh, for example, classical part of an oscillator, you expect it to modify equation of motion, and the equation of motion you obtain by taking derivative with respect to x quantum, so you would expect that classical part of your oscillator is coupled to x quantum. <coughs> okay, good. Uh, now what? Uh, so now your, uh, your uh, oscillators are oscillators, Gaussian, by definition. Couldn't be getting ever any more Gaussian than, than that. So you want to integrate them up. Right? So, so schematically you have your i to the uh, gs phi s sum over s um, phi sigma one x. So I'm sort of using matrix notation. And you want to integrate out with the fluctuations of over, over five fields. Okay. Now since it's a Gaussian integral, you, you know what to do, so it's going to be e to the minus one half uh, sum over s uh, g s square, and then the, 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 the square of this thing. Right? So let me try to write it in the following way. S transpose sigma one by S by S sigma one X and then <coughs> and I'm simply using the property of the Gaussian integral that e to the I five average e to the minus one half phi square. Nothing more, nothing else. All right, so, so then this is the, the, the I have to be a little bit more careful now. This is the time t, t, t prime, t prime, and they have double integral. T prime. Now this is our friend. This is a matrix green function of, of, of harmonic oscillators with all the 
has a little structure. So the, the, the normalized quadratic action of my axis, right, and the thing which the center bound is, um, is this. So I will call it probably D. So D has a structure of sigma 1 uh, sum over S. Sum over S, GS square, sigma 1, bosonic green, GS, sigma 1. Where the sigmas are again in this plate or Keldish space. Okay, good. So now uh, we know what, what is G, right? So G uh, S is uh, Keldish as G target as G once as zero and G target uh, of epsilon. Now everything above is in equilibrium. That's an assumption. So since Bach is in equilibrium, this guy depends on the t minus two prime. And then I, of course, go to, to the Fourier representation, so not to the life. So what I have is two of epsilon, which is, of course, nothing else but epsilon square minus omega s squared plus There's no chemical potential here? Uh, let's, say that. let's say that this is a uh, radiation field with zero chemical. <coughs> I mean, if, if you think about it, then real oscillators cannot have chemical potential. So chemical potential is a property of complex fields. Which the number of particles is, is conserved. There's number operator. If you deal with real oscillators, you better put zero chemical potential. And it's a symmetry in the theory. Right? But zero. All right. So now, now, now you uh, you do with sigma one. Uh, uh, rotate with, with two sigma one matrices. And then, guess what you got? You got a um, structure, which is what you expect to get, namely zero here, V advanced here, Z departed here, and Z counted here. And why is that? Because this thing is what is sitting in the action. Right? So this is my uh, equation of motion or the action of, of X field. And Causality structure dictates that the action better be of that form. Right? And of course, if you simply rotate this guy with two sigma ones, then you then you obtain this. So no, no question about that. Right? So now who are they? So this, for example, T retarded and then ones, where sum over S, my coupling constant square. Um, and Yes, and then for one or omega, uh, I'm sorry, epsilon plus minus I naught square minus omega s square. This is function of s. Okay. And without any calculation, you can claim that simply that Kildish component is again simply cotangent. Epsilon of the T of whatever you find for the target minus whatever you find for the ones. You can prove it, but uh, I mean you can obtain it by, by algebraic means, but it, it must be the, the case and it is the case. So far. Alright, now to do this, 
you need some assumption about uh, what is called spectral density of your bump. Right? So you introduce a function which is uh, g of <coughs> omega, which is sum over s, g of s, I think. <coughs> is delta of omega minus omega s. So if you can use this uh, notation, then your function is uh, simply integral over uh, taking that epsilon. <coughs> epsilon uh, of epsilon times j of epsilon and epsilon square minus plus minus i zero square minus one to minus Omega, 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 epsilon plus minus I zero minus omega square. Yeah. <coughs> that's, that's what it is. Now, then there is a sort of uh, freedom of choosing what I think about my bug. And it seems that uh, there is sort of enormous freedom to choose whatever you wish. But in, in, in fact, it's, it's not. Uh, you, you can convince yourself that sort of pretty much any reasonable block you can think about should have this quantity to be linear in, in omega. Right. You, you, you take a particle moving in superfluid, you take an uh, uh, electron liquid, and you want to treat it as a buff, you will always end up with a statement that this spectral function goes like omega times a constant, which I will call gamma, for gamma. I'm, I'm not keeping factors of two anyway. And this common literature with the name omega buff. <coughs> Where is J sitting in your, in your action? But J, I, I simply introduce this J by definition here. To it's like density of states. It's a density of states, and it, it, it's, it's weighted density of states, yes, there, I'm sorry. Uh, because it knows also about coupling constants with, with your particle. So it's sort of coupling function, I don't know how to call it. Uh, and, and then I'm sort of telling you without any proof that pretty much any reasonable real life example you can think of will always lead to, to something like this. Okay, but this you have to believe in. All right, good. So if you saw that we are sort of in a good shape because then all that we have is four gamma integral d omega, omega square epsilon square minus omega square. Now this integral is actually bad because it, it's, it's divergent, right? But, uh, okay, so what, what, what I'm, um, essentially I can say minus epsilon square plus epsilon square. Then this thing gives me an integration of one. And it is divergent, of course, and this divergence is sitting in the fact that there is some very cutoff. So I cannot go with this density of states to continue. So there is a cutoff. And I don't care what it is. So if there is some dumb constant which is sitting in a cutoff. And if you read original. Uh, Caldera legged paper, we have painfully long two or three pages discussion of what to do with this constant, right, where it's coming from. So I simply put it under cover. I don't care. 
Um, but then what's, what's remained is uh, plus or gamma d omega epsilon square omega epsilon plus or minus i zero square of minus omega. So that already convergent integral, very good one. Uh, we know how to calculate it. But schematically, if you integrate over d omega, you get 1 over epsilon. And then there is epsilon square. Right. So simply by, you know, by dimensionality, you see, this is dimensionless. Whatever is, is coming up should be epsilon. <coughs> and it, it, it comes back to the main unit. So this is C down constant plus four plus minus four i gamma times epsilon. So I think you can, the more physical way to say about this constant is just, it, it defines the physical stiffness of the object. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, Leo is always right. If you, if you now take this constant, it's sitting in, uh, uh, there is my D. Yes, it's sitting somewhere here. Um, if I look now, what is it for the action of my oscillator? It's a renormalization of the harmonic part of the potential. Okay, so the coupling from the buffer renormalizes my potential. Okay. So I would forget about this constant, but think that this potential is already not a bare potential, but a renormalized potential, whatever it is. And this is this <coughs> infinitely long and painful discussion and how that relates to that. All right, uh, but the important thing is that it's, it, it comes with an opposite sign, and let me check that I'm pretty tough with advanced then, hopefully. Yes, plus minus, that, that it's actually two and not four, but yeah, who cares? Um, uh, it comes with this gamma, which is a property of the bar, and it, and it can be linear linear. The okay. Now finally, uh, I want to know what is dk, and I stupidly erased it. Uh, so again, dk is a cotangent of epsilon over to t of uh, d retarded minus d once. Uh, now this dumb constant drops. So it, it doesn't uh, do anything to, to this Kelvin part. And this is a good news. Uh, so we really don't care about it, it uh, here. So what, what's remain is um, 4i gamma epsilon times quantum of epsilon of 2t. <coughs> so now I know what is my thing d. And d is renormalizing my potential. Right? Uh, uh, normalizing my action of my classical particle. So now I can go back and, and to, to write action of my classical particle uh, with, with the buff with the buff included. Is just first time derivative. So therefore, what I'm getting here is uh, x quantum 
and so that will be like classical uh, plus or minus uh, plus uh, gamma x dot and then this d of x classical plus x one minus d of x classical minus x one. And instead of writing this as two terms, I start the uh, classical part of one to classical, I, I do integration by parts, and I write them as, as a single term. But you should understand that this single term, the sort of better way of writing it is a, is a two terms. And it's important that the, the sign was opposite here. <coughs> Because by doing integration by parts, they not cancel each other, but they double each other. Okay. So what you see is that uh, I, uh, in what I got is uh, friction. Okay. My, my equation of motion, you call an equation of motion if I go to settle point, now requires friction. Okay. And this friction came directly from this uh, d retarded the advanced parts of, of the induced action. Okay. But there is something else. Uh, there is also a Heldish component of my action, um, which, is, um, which is just this. Okay. So here, um, I need to uh, worry a little bit, because uh, there's some complicated function of epsilon. And if I want to, to do it in a time representation, I have to do a Fourier transform. <coughs> okay, so you work a little bit and you write down what is a Fourier transform of this function. And it appears as a t square hyperbolic sine square of phi temperature t minus theta. So this is nothing else but dk t minus theta. So <coughs> you're simply Fourier transformation in that. Okay. And it's sitting here, so it's coming with two quantum fields. So is uh, gamma two integrals dt 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 prime x quantum of t this stuff whatever this y t square c square y t t minus t prime uh, x quantum of t prime. All right, so that's uh, pretty much uh, finally completed. For a while, this came from the Hilfers. And as, as I will argue pretty soon, th this is about uh, fluctuation. Now notice that this thing is still completely ordered function of x quantum. If I will expand this thing, only, only odd powers will so this is an even thing. So it breaks this observation that the action should be for the function, which came from time reversal in there. So what happened is that integrating the continuum bar and generating this uh, I epsilon out of seemingly completely real integral, okay, the sort of integrating integrated real function got a complex number that's, that's an always think about poles in the interval. And, and poles are coming from the tap and step on this continuum. So you're always touching some of the poles, right? So that brought us uh, this uh, even function in x1. Okay. Moreover, this function happens to be uh, non-local in time. But that's nothing to do with it, so it is. 
Okay. Um, okay, so two things. This one, that one, they come with the same coefficient, which is characterizing coupling strength of the buff. Um, or so that, that, that that's a that's a product. Now we, we can go deeper in there. So what what how the Rodriguez story is about is let's go to zero temperature. You go to zero temperature, you see that you should erase this hyperbolic sign, then temperature drops, and all what you got getting is one over t minus t prime squared. So that's a famous one over t minus t prime square kernel of, uh, of caldera uh, um, quantum dissipation. Uh, they do it in imaginary time. I sort of show you how to do it uh, in real time. So now if you want to discuss how it affects tunneling from, from a potential well, what, what is the tunnel? Tunneling to escape time and all that, you, you have to be clever because it's not immediate obvious how to treat tunneling in, in real time. And it's very interesting discussion, but I'm not going to go through. Okay. Instead, what I want to go into it is uh, to, to take another look and say, let's think that temperature is, is, is actually very high. Okay. So now then, what we need to do is to, to find the limit of this thing in, in the opposite limit of, of a high temperature. And I'm looking where I wrote this thing, and you can uh, guess the answer maybe. of this capital T? It's a temperature. So when you go Each to one. infinite temperature, uh, how do you compare T? T compared to right. what other Very good. Very good. So look, that's, that's actually a very well placed question because T, because it KBT, right, has the dimensionality of energy. So here is T minus the time. It's time. So where is that H bar? sitting in the background here. So what is actually each part? So in some sense, you can either think of not, not here. Maybe. Uh, but, but in any case, uh, it's certainly here, right? No, no, no way about it. So you can either think about it as, as t goes to infinity, or each bar goes to zero. And what it sort of suggests <laughs> Uh, that what you compare is temperature with a sort of level quantization in your potential. Right. So if temperature is bigger than the quantization of levels, then uh, it doesn't okay. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Um, 
it's, it's, it's actually a very good point because I maybe I maybe not want to, to keep this. I think explicit here. Um, so I erase the double integral. Um, now for the single integral, there is a temperature sitting here, and then I have x quantum square, there is a h bar square over here. <coughs> I, want, I need to be careful about how many h bars I have. I mean, there was an H, there's an H bar, he could I S over H bar. Two H bars is correct. Yeah, there should be. Well, I, I'll tell you what the correct answer is, but then we can restore the, the, the H bar. Now, another way of uh, looking at, at, at it given some this temperature is, is simply go back to here uh, and take the limit of large temperature and acknowledge that. Uh, at small value of argument, cotangent x is 1 over x. Right? So if you go here, and you go t to infinity. Here, but this epsilon rolls, and what you got is whatever. A my gamma temperature. Okay. So now it's epsilon independent. So now if I do a Fourier transform, then of course I'm getting something local. And that's what it is. Right? So this classical limit is always about substituting cotangent of epsilon at a temperature by two temperature over epsilon. So if you wish, that's a, a definition of classical mechanics. And you, then you don't care about a Planck distribution, but you substitute it by a repartition. Okay, so that, that's all the same. Now, the, the, the last thing is that uh, that's still not good enough because look, uh, remember that uh, there is an H bar, of course, <coughs> here, right? to begin with, to make action has dimensionality of uh, one over H bar. Right? Yes, action is H bar has dimensionality. And, and we want to do a classical physics, right? So uh, we want to get rid of that, because it, that, that's not what I would do. And then you have to acknowledge that actually your quantum field is proportional to h bar times x quantum t. Right. So that's about quantum fluctuations. And uh, we better understand that there is a hidden h bar here. We better redefine what we call quantum field. Okay. Now look, if I do that, then I want to keep zero order in h bar. Okay. So I want this h bar to be constant. And then so here I'm good because this guy. This guy knows about his linear in h bar. But this guy, in principle, have all the higher terms. But I don't want them. So what I have to uh, retain from here is simply x quantum times dv dx classical. Newtonian term. Right? Then again, h bar will be done. And notice this h bar square also done. Okay. So if I go to the classical limit of it, what I'm getting out of it is redefine re x quantum. This h bar is gone. That is good. Instead of that, I'm simply adding here dv dx classical, which depends on x classical. Uh, and here I, I erase this h bar square. So 
that's the proper classical limit of my caldera legged uh, construction. Okay. okay, now what are we going to do? Uh, and there are a few, few games in town which you may play. So let's start from the game which is called plunging in a page. this Gaussian integral over psi and you will be back to, to the le left hand side of my What happened is that everything is now linear in x quantum. So this term i, I am probably missing some factors of two. So the x quantum uh, times psi i stick in, in, into this. Right? Now since everything is linear in x quantum, and I'm doing my integral from minus infinity to infinity, at which time slice then what I'm, all that I'm getting is a delta function of this thing at each and every point in time. Right? If it's, if it's like I could follow from yeah, so what I'm saying is that the integral of dx quantum minus infinity into the i a x quantum is delta function. <coughs> I, there is a time integral of dt. So what you're actually mentally assuming is that you discretize this, this integral, and then at each time slice you have integral like this. So in each time slice, whatever is this expression is, it should be equal to zero. So at each and every moment of time, you want to maintain uh, <coughs> the fact that this thing is, is zero. So, so instead of all that, 
And instead of integration of this, I simply write delta function of x double dot classical plus gamma x dot uh, plus the dx plus or minus You know, what is it about? This is about reforming. Suppose I want to calculate some correlation function. Uh, X classical at time t and X classical at time t prime. So if I would like to calculate this correlation function, X classical of t is classical of t prime. Any other correlation function to that method. You choose. Okay. So all what I'm doing, I'm sticking this as a prefactor in my functional integral. So this is x classical of t, x classical of t prime. Right? Now what is this? What this thing tells me is that out of all possible x classicals, I have to choose only those which satisfy this equation. Right? Then on those realizations, I have to take my prefactor, whatever I'm interested in. Okay. And then in the very end, <coughs> average it over Gaussian distribution of Xi. Okay. So what I end up with is that instead of doing all that, I can do completely different thing. I can simply solve a uh, differential equation with the stochastic force. X double dot plus is equal minus dx minus <coughs> x dot plus psi of t. So this is Newtonian equation with, with ra random force. I am solving it. I am taking what I want to know. X of time t, x of time t prime, x of time t double prime, whatever you wish. And I average it over all the realizations over noise, okay, or noise sign. It is Gaussian by definition. So all what I have to tell you, I have to tell you what is a correlator of this noise sign. And just looking at this, <coughs> you immediately see that this is two uh, gamma t delta t minus t. That's because we've taken the high temperature limit that we get right. in white noise. Right. So this delta function is essentially the same delta function which was maybe still is uh, at that level. Right. Now what, what else is, is here is fluctuation dissipation theory. Remember my Keldish component came from cotangent. So in the classical level, fluctuation dissipation theorem is manifest itself in the statement that whatever amplitude of noise is. It's a di dissipation strength times temperature, average two. Okay. So this, the strength of a, the amplitude of the noise and the dissipation constant in your equation of motion are related by simple proportionality coefficient, and this proportionality coefficient is called temperature. Okay. That's F, F, T, T. <coughs> yes. So we have managed to trade uh, some quantum field with some classical fluctuating noise. Yes. Um, <coughs> and you see exactly how it is. Sure. But now my question is, uh, it seems that this should be possible at any temperature, right? Even before taking the... Yes, you, you could do it in, at any temperature. Uh, then this thing will not be local in time, but that's okay. And you could think that uh, sort of any quantum problem is equivalent to this classical thing with some properly correlated noise, right? That's actually not quite true, because there was one thing else which we committed. Instead of doing this guy, 
I expanded it to, to the first half. And that's essential. Not that I know to put exactly how it <laughs> enters, but I do understand that this is very essential. So when I go to purely quantum problem, this expansion is never a good idea. And that's what I mentioned uh, an hour ago, that scaling of this field and this field become the same. This is not anymore an, an irrelevant operator in, in zero temperature. So, so I would be pretty careful about writing this thing with some noise and claiming that, that it represents a quantum problem. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, could you describe some of the physical intuitions of that term? Because I would have thought that dissipation um, for the quantum problem at low temperatures leads to localization. And then temperature can kind of could work against that by leading to thermal activation. Yes. Kind of yeah, 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 two yeah, yeah, yeah. opposite effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're right. Ask this question in, in, in half an hour, if it's not clear. Yes? Uh, before doing the Hubbard stroke-rich techniques, I can integral x q directly, and then I can extract the exact equation. You can. You can. You can do this Gaussian in the graph, and then what you will have in the action is a square of this. Yeah. And this is called one zaya Malchap function. Um, and some people like it and sort of work from, from this point. Uh, I think it's a bad idea. It's, it's, it's much better to keep uh, your structure as it should be from sort of Kelly's perspective. But, but you can. Yes? Besides the fact that you labeled it X classical, why should I think of X classical as the location of the particle? This is what satisfies Newtonian relation. Well, I mean, I can't add uh, anything else from this here. Probably as, as good as I am to, to interpret. Is it fair to think of X classical as a sort of part that's the same or the incoming and outgoing yes, part yes, of the trajectory? Yes, yes, yes. Quantum is a part that's right, different? Right, right. Yes. Okay. That's what, some, in some sense, what your particle does in average. And then there are fluctuations, which is classical or quantum. You see it maybe purely classical, which try to move you away. But again, notations are a little bit because you know you, you, you see it, it, I use a quantum field, but they claim that there is no it's h equal to zero limit, right? So it's simply a, a way to incorporate classical noise into your action. Okay? Go on. Go on from now uh, so so this is sort of equilibrium setup because they started from equilibrium path and uh, and uh, the way it manifests itself is that we, we end up with, with this uh, relation between dissipation and, um, and noise. Now, many people are brave and say we will describe non equilibrium problems. Right? And then they start from the Langevin equations, the classical Langevin equations. Right? And then the Langevin equation is not a result of all this machinery, it's sort of an equation number one huge number of papers if you look at the classical literature. Right? People just postulate that we will describe some process and then there is some noise added to this process. And it may be traffic jams, it may be, uh, I don't know, financial markets, it may be whatever you wish. And there is no, of course, equilibrium. So you may think uh, how to sort of use this machinery if you start from something like this. Okay? How to go back. Yes. So that Gaussian noise comes from the linear coupling of your field. Is it correct? Um, the origin of the Gaussian noise always goes back to the linear coupling. Yes, you may say so, yes. 
and then if I add nonlinear coupling, then I might get non Gaussian. So nobody promised that this thing has a purely Gaussian thing. Yeah. That's a very frequent assumption, but there's no law of nature which tells you that any noise should be Gaussian noise, of course. So if I see that non Gaussian noise, then maybe I have to yeah. on the way back. Yeah, but there was your starting point. There is nothing fundamentally fundamental about noise being up, just convenient approximation. Great. Now suppose I I start from something like this. And for example, I can even think that uh, what noise is coming is not just uh, in this term, it may be multiplied by some function of x cos. And then, more often than not, your problem is, is immediately becoming non-equilibrium, whether you want it or not. Right? Uh, and then you can declare some, some uh, noise <coughs> correlation function, whether you call it temperature or you doesn't call it temperature, it's completely up to you. So there is some strength of the noise. Let me call it probability. That's a good notation. You may be field dependent. Hmm? Maybe field dependent. Right? Well, it, it's it's interchangeable. You can either introduce field dependence here, or you can introduce it here, right? Um, there are a little bit of subtleties there, and uh, I'll try to, to tell it. But uh, for me, the simple way is, is just to put something here, and then think that this is just a constant, right? Because while doing this integral, you don't want to know anything about your axis anymore. All right, then how would you go about this? <coughs> go about this means going back. Yes, how will you go back? Reverse the steps. Hmm? Reverse the steps. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reverse the step. Um, what should I, if you excuse me, I'll go to the men's room for a second. Microphone. statement? Yes, Very good. It would be a fair statement if I would add Jacobian, because the integral of a delta function is not necessarily one. It's a partition function. Um, I don't want to have it, because I, I'm lazy and I don't want to calculate the right? No way. So how, how can I avoid doing it? Is it in a discretization? Very good. I need to be clever to pick a proper discretization of this thing. And the proper one is, of course, retarded. Very occasional, if you want. Namely, if I think about it in, in a discrete time, what I would like to say is that uh, 
these things are something like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, maybe minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. That's the way to write second derivative. <coughs> then I can write first derivative, but whatever I do, I will worry to have lower triangular matrix. Okay. If I will give my equation to a computer, I have to be very careful that I'm discretizing it in that way and not in a, let's say, symmetric way. So I put minus 2 on the diagonals and 1 and minus 1 set the way to the diagonal, right? Uh, so if I do that, you see that the only term coming to the determinant is the diagonal, and this is 1. So therefore, if I'm careful to understand this operator as a retarded operator, then I can do this. Okay. Now, in classical literature, this statement is known as Ito regularization. Mm -hmm. so you put the, the noise term also off the animal. What do you do with the noise term? <coughs> uh, well, I see you just. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you put it below the other. You put the time. You, you shift it. You sh you react, you put, your regularization is such that it should be below the other. It's, it's easier to think a little bit if you have first order equation. Let's say times dot is equal to gamma and right? Neglect inertia. Think about order damped problem. And that's what I will be doing next, actually. Uh, minus dv dx plus noise. So the way to discretize this x dot is to say that I have x j minus x j minus 1, then this is times delta t. But these things I will calculate at, at the time, previous time step, right? Mm -hmm. So it's calculated t, t j minus 1. Mm -hmm. okay. And that is known as an eta regularization. And if you have this thing, which is known as multiplicative noise, So if your noise is not what we had before, but is multiplied by some uh, on some function of x, then this equation doesn't have sense before you specify regularization. You will get a different result in different regularization. It doesn't have good continuous meaning away from specific regularization. And the two more most famous in the, in the market are this ETO, which is simply retarded way of regularization. And by some reason, which I don't understand, mathematicians would tell you that this is the only consistent thing to do things. Right? And I'm very happy about it because this is precisely what my Keldish technique prescribed me to do. But classical physicists often use another regularization, which is known as Stratanovich. Uh, which is essentially just symmetric thing. You, you take half sum of this right hand side at time j and at time j minus 1. Okay? That's a different regularization. If you insist working in this, you have to take care about this Jacobian. It's not a very good idea. But somehow mathematicians are collaborating in this respect, surprisingly. <laughs> and, and say that there is no structure, it's just nonsense. Uh, Don't you also have to integrate over the classical noise? Yeah, I'm not, I, I haven't finished yeah. this, this sentence, right? So, uh, so I get rid of, of this Jacobian. So now, of course, this, is, this averaging is understood in a classical sense over realizations of noise psi. So I have to do now regularization. <coughs> Uh, now, what do I do next? Next, I play this thing back. Instead of writing data function, I will write it as e to the i x quantum. Okay, and I will introduce also integration of x quantum. Okay, and uh, now I will write explicitly this psi averaging. Uh, 
here, so it's g psi e to the minus psi squared over 2g. Uh, now notice that integral over psi is Gaussian, and that's the beauty of choosing Gaussian noise. So here is a psi square, here is a linear term in psi. Okay. So I, I, I do that, and what I generate, I generate a um, square of this. So finally, I'm ending up with dx classical and x quantum, uh, my, my interrelation function, whatever it is, and then my action is uh, x quantum times classical equation of motion. No noise anymore. I already took care of noise. But uh, what I pay price for this is, is this thing, um, x quantum square g of x classical square. Okay. So it's essentially, again, the Kelders theory. Classical and quantum precisely on both places which you would expect them to be. It's not Gaussian anymore, like somebody mentioned that we can do this Gaussian integration or X cube. In this case, you can't because it's now also depending on, on X classical. But nevertheless, it's, it's, it's the theory with all the same properties which we know and love. Okay? Okay, that's good. Now, what, what do we do? Go one way, go another way, but, but after all, what do we do? Um, and then there is another game in town, which is called um, photo Planck equation. So what is a photo Planck equation? It is to say that, look, I have realization of this uh, X, uh, of this uh, stochastic process. Let me calculate the following thing. Let me calculate um, probability, classical probability, to, to find my particle at point x classical. Let me suppress classical from now on, x. Uh, at point t. So if I would know this, then at least one point correlation functions I can easily calculate. I can calculate what is just x average, x square average at the coinciding time. If I want to know correlation function in non-coinciding times, I actually have to work more. But at least in coinciding times, I, 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 I would know everything possible. It's possible to know. Also, the response functions. Hmm? You can't get response functions. You cannot get response functions from, from here. I mean, you can, but uh, not from here. <laughs> All right. So uh, how to think about it? For this reason, let me. Um, simplify my life a little bit and neglect inertia. I don't think that dissipation is sufficiently strong. And this inertial term is of no importance. It's not a limitation whatsoever, but it's just for pedagogical reasons. Uh, that's what I like. <coughs> So then what I have is, and, and I will put gamma equal to 1. It's just fixing some, some units of time, whatever. Um, so I get x quantum, x dot classical, and then x quantum plus all this. And then let me do the following thing. Let me d 
deform my contour of integration along of quant x quantum from the real axis to the imaginary axis. We can discuss the words a minus and procedure, but I think the answer is yes. So I simply want to get rid of imaginary units here. Uh, and I will call it, believe me or not, P. And X classical, I will call, believe me or not, X. Okay, why I'm doing that? Because look what I'm getting now. I'm getting x dot minus h of p and x dt where h of p and x is a funny thing it has p dv dx plus t square times g square Just notation. Okay? But notation which pretty much tells you everything what's going on. Uh, what is it? And I have functional linking over dp and dx. If I take saddle point, then yes, but I, I don't want to take saddle point. Okay. What is it? Hmm? Okay. It's, it's a quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. Just one particle <laughs> quantum mechanics. Functional integral of PMs dot minus Hamiltonian. What is the goodness quantum mechanics? Hamiltonian is crazy. It's not P square plus real of X. It's something else. But, but otherwise, it's completely honest quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, if you, somebody gave you Feynman buff integral for the quantum mechanics. This is in Hamiltonian, not in Lagrangian formulation. Who cares? So, what, what, what would you do next step? Find a wavefunction. Hmm? Find a wavefunction. Hmm. How? So I'm showing the equation. Very good. You write Schrodinger equation, right? So how to write Schrodinger equation if you if you see this without any any <laughs> what, what you do, you say that P and X are not any more numbers, they are operators. So we go back to operators if you wish, and bind all this coherent state. So X and P are operators, and they obey commutation relation. One, I, and slope. There is no I here. It's a major time quantum mechanics, so commutation relation should be understood. And then the Schrodinger equation for the wave function, and I will call wave function P. In a sec, I will explain why this thing is nothing else but, but the wave function. So the equation, Schrodinger equation is dt of P, again, imaginary time, no I, is equal to H acting on P. Agreed? Now, how do I write H as an operator? I choose a representation, and I will choose a representation where X is a number, and then P is an operator, which is DDX. Is it not better to have some computation? With P and that, that's a shame. So P is not an operator? P is a wave function which in this case have a sense of probability, not an amplitude. And the reason why the wave function here has a meaning of probability instead of meaning of an amplitude is uh, because we calculate close quantum. So you essentially calculate psi and then psi bar. Doing the final construction here, we end up with, with calculating psi times psi bar. Essentially, our wave 
what and what wave function has a meaning of must have a meaning of probability and, and, and then that. All right. So all what I do, I, I substitute in my Hamiltonian P by by the operator. And I have to worry that my Hamiltonian is written in normally ordered form, because otherwise what I'm doing is not good enough. Right? Remember that to do all this coherent uh, state representation, to go from shading equation to this, I use coherent states, and I crucially use that Hamiltonian as normally ordered. Okay? So the way I, I wrote, uh, the reason I wrote it in this way is it's not accidental. I want it to be normally ordered. And if it is, then I simply can can stick it here. Okay. So what you got is the following. You you got uh, d dx of db dx times p. That's a brief term in your Fourier point equation, and then you have d two dx square of this thing that we call the diffusion coefficient of x. Uh, um, argue what is normal ordered here? This. Yeah, we simply want p to, to be to the left and x to be to the right. Because then. Oh, because back to the Yeah, that's how I can state it. And then I substitute it by the order. So what, what, what you see is that uh, what I got is a sort of diffusion equation, possibly with drift. In a probability space. So my probability, if you think about probability as a density of your independent particles, diffuse and drift. Okay? And your Langevin equation, again, on the level of single time correlation functions, is, is, is completely equivalent to, uh, to this photo point equation, diffusion equation. Function derived, right? Say it again. You could have, in more detail, you could have just derived this by putting in a delta function that x at time t equals to x of t. And you put it into your, compute the expectation value of a delta function of x. Um, yes. Right. You could have actually evaluated yeah, yeah. First principle, the value of probability. But you know, I don't want to evaluate it. I just want to show you the equation, which is satisfied. Right? How I'm going to solve this equation? It's it's another it's another complication. It's not for free. Okay. Good. So uh, and again, it's it's easily generalizable for any more complicated problem. If I have uh, two derivatives here, then I simply have to. Uh, have probability distribution of heading coordinate x and momentum k here. So I will, my, my photo plan, the left hand side of my photo plan equation will become precisely the same as, as the left hand side of my kinetic equation. So I will do this. Now notice that there is a physical momentum which I call k, and there is an auxiliary momentum which I they're completely different. It's not even really additional It's come from classical quantum sort of derivative. So behind any physical Hamiltonian, if you wish, potential, there is another Hamiltonian which where you double the number of degrees of freedom. Again, the, the message is that whenever you have non-equilibrium theory, you always have to double number of degrees of freedom. In the overdam problem, I have now coordinate and auxiliary momentum. If I were thinking about underdam problem, I have um, coordinate, physical momentum, and two auxiliary variables which correspond to them. 
So I don't have four dimensional sort. Again, how do I see that P is a probability uh, by calculating correlation functions and seeing how it appears? Yeah, if, if, if you think about microscopic derivation, I mean, I sort of give you a heuristic way to, to derive it. So the microscopic way of this derivation, if you open final Heaps book, he will tell you integrate all the way up to time t, and then add, call it psi, add infinitesimal time slice, integrate it, and see how this psi evolved from this situation to this situation. Right, so. Now here, if you think what it is, then you integrate all the way up to time t, you, you conclude that it's psi and that it's psi bar. So, so what you are deriving is equation for probability, not equation for, for, for the amplitude. All right, so now in, in, in remaining 10 minutes, I want to, to, to tell you this. So now this is a quote unquote Schrodinger equation. Still didn't tell you how to solve it. Still big, big problem. So what's it, one of the best way of solving? Solving shading the equation. It's not the best way. Yeah. That's a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> theory about uh, it's even worse. Semic classes. You do it semi class. More often than not, your problem actually doesn't require a quantum nonsense. <laughs> um, so how, how do you solve uh, semi-classic? So if you first investigate classical mechanics. Right. Okay, how do you investigate classical mechanics? You solve classical equation of motion. So what is it in this case? Here is my classical semi-classic. Right. This is very non-conventional. Right. So we're, we're all used to think about P squared plus V of X. We know everything about that. But here I'm telling you that you have to think about classical mechanics completely, you know, in the textbook way, one of the uh, mechanics. But with the Hamiltonians, which have structure 